my whole life, I have been a refraction of somebody else's pronoun. They, yeah. as in my parents, she, as in Hillary, and he, as in Anthony. And, and the last part of the book, you know, where I write suffering, the chapter suffering is optional, right. is about me reclaiming myself, my own identity, and figuring out who I'm going to be when I grow up. Welcome to Arm Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am Donnie Deutsch, and this is the podcast dedicated to a simple premise that everybody and everything today is a brand. Every celebrity, every athlete, uh, every uh, political party, every business, every product, every person. If, if you've got a Facebook page, uh, you're, you're a brand. Uh, a brand is a set of values, what, what you stand for, your essence. Uh, and we do two things on the show. First, we interview a uh, per- person about their own personal brand, a, a well-known person, a celebrity, and today it's Huma Abedin. Huma is... Of course, uh, Hillary Clinton's right hand for years uh, was married to Anthony Weiner. Of course, the scandals that came out of that, and she's been very open talking about that in her book and the emails that came. And and it, she's an incredible woman. She's got a new book out. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about her life growing up in Saudi Arabia and uh, right up to the present day. But first, we do what we call our brands of the week. These are our brands that are uh, shaping where we're going, how we're getting there. The brands that are up, the brands that are down, we make it in review and let's get right into it. Our first brand of the week is Tom Brady. Because Tom Brady is, I don't know how, I don't know how to say a brand up or brand down. Brand sideways because he's maybe retiring. But Tom Brady always gets a brand up on the show. This guy is the, he's the goat. And just the way he's just carried himself in every way. And I have a feeling he's he's retiring. I don't think this would have come out that way. He didn't, he wants to do it on his own terms. It leaked. Uh, I think he's probably going to want to wait till after the Super Bowl. But if I was a betting man, I'd, I'd say quite surely he is retiring. But I think at 44, he's put in his time in seven Super Bowls and so on and so forth. Brand up for... Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, the look, the last two weeks of football have been ridiculous. Six playoff games, six nail biters, best best playoff run ever. And they, if you've been watching football, but the Cinderella story is the Cincinnati Bengals and, and Joe Burrow, uh, their their young quarterback. Two years ago, these guys were last in the league. They had the number one pick, and now they're going to the Super Bowl, and they're fun. And I think the Rams are great, also. But you got to give a brand of the week to uh, the Cincinnati Bengals. Brand of the week to Justice Stephen Breyer, who is announced his retirement. Thank goodness. There was a lot of talk in the past about Ruth Ginsburg, uh, that she should have retired uh, before she passed away in office when uh, they were not Democrats were not able to replace her because she she passed away during um, Trump's presidency. So he, of course, got to appoint Supreme Court justice uh, where hopefully people thought she should have maybe resigned when uh, Obama was still president. But Breyer's not going to allow that to happen. He's old. He's 83. Um, he's not going to take a chance of him being in office if Republican gets in. And so I think he's doing the right thing for the team. And speaking of the team, a brand down for the Democrats. Democrats is a new poll that's just very, very, very scary. According to a new Gallup poll, 47% of Americans now identify the Republican Party versus only 42 with Democrats. And what's stunning about that, it's never been the case. Since they started tracking this in 1991, it's usually a four-point differential where people identify being Democrats versus Republicans. Now that's switched. And that that nine, eight or nine-point switch is a dramatic switch. So a lot of bad news for the Democrats, which doesn't make sense when I talk about my next brand up with the U.S. economy. U.S. economy grew last year at the fastest pace since 1984. Um, unemployment dropped to 3.9%. The GDP group, 5.7%. So we're talking about uh, 36 years, best economy, and yet the Democrats seem to be in trouble. Uh, they have not gotten their message out there. We've talked a lot of that on the show a lot. A brand down for the United States. It drops out of the top 25 of least corrupt nations amid continuous attacks on free and fair elections. Now, this is something a study is called Transparency International's 2021 Corruption Perception Index. It measures the perception of public sector corruption, according to experts and business people, ranks 180 countries and territories on a scale of highly corrupt zero to very clean 100. They had been in the top 25 and they've fallen out of the United States. And that's obviously what's going on with with, uh, Trump and the insurrection and calling our elections into question. So that's not good for the United States. Brand down for Representative Matt Gates. Witness can confirm Matt Gates was told he had sex with a minor. Uh, of course, the congressman who uh, uh, allegations and uh, we seem to think indictments are coming 
Um, uh, according to his confession letter, Joe Greenberg, that's his part, that was his business associate and friend who already got arrested in this, called his friend Matt Gates, Gates with some bad news. A teenager both men had paid to have sex was underage, Greenberg claimed. Now two sources tell the Daily Beast a cooperating witness can confirm details of the call for one damning reason. He was in Greenberg's office when the call took place. So uh, seems as if Matt Gates knows about that. And I don't think Matt Gates' future is very, very bright. Brand up for Spotify. Brand, big brand up for Neil Young. Um, and now a begrudging brand up for Joe Rogan. Well, Spotify lost $2 billion of stock plummets after Neil Young, Joe Rogan protest. Neil Young, one of the artists on Spotify, said, I'm, then I can't carry my music anymore. If they're going to allow Joe Rogan, who, who puts out, you know, incorrect uh, things about vaccine, about the vaccine, uh, about vaccines, which is obviously unsafe for people's health to get misinformation. And other artists followed, Springsteen, Joni Mitchell, and Spotify had a problem. Originally, they sided with Joe Rogan and they said, okay, Neil Young, go, but they realized they're going to lose all their artists. And Joe Rogan has come around and, and said that he's he was going to, do a better job of, pre of presenting both sides. And that also Spotify said they were going to put warnings on his show. So kind of a crazy thing. So a brand all over the place for all three of those brands. Brand up for Cheryl Hines. Cheryl Hines, of course, on Curb Enthusiasm. Love her. She's married to Bob Kennedy Jr. Robert Kennedy Jr. is kind of a wacko. Well, and she called her husband reprehensible for invoking Anne Frank in the vaccine speech. This is another genius that brings up Nazi Germany comparing anything to having to do with the Holocaust with um, what happens with making people get mandated vaccines. During a DC anti-vax rally on Sunday, Kennedy suggested the situation is worse today for those in the US who oppose vaccine mandates than it was for Anne Frank. Uh, she hid from the Nazis, obviously. And this is a quote, even Hitler Germany, you could cross the Alps into Switzerland. You could hide in an attic like Anne Frank did, Kennedy said. Today, the mechanisms are being put in place that will make if none of us can run and none of us can hide, I'm sure this would make his father turn over in his grade. Shame on you, Robert Kennedy Jr., but a big brand up to his wife who said it like it is. Huge brand up for Sarah Palin, and I say this for personal reasons also. It was in the news that Sarah Palin uh, was uh, inside a restaurant, restaurant, my favorite restaurant that I frequent, Elio's, uh, unvaccinated. Uh, somehow she slipped in. And what's even worse, she was back a couple of nights later when she knew she had COVID. She claimed she sat outside, but what the fuck? I, I mean, so first of all, you're unvaccinated. You go into a restaurant, which so somehow you slipped in there. And I mean, it, it happened. I guess it happens. But the fact that you got COVID and you went back and you go, well, I sat outside. Have you ever heard of, of anything called, uh, 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 what's it called when you, uh, wait, I'm having a mental break here. Quarantine. There we go. <laughs> I guess you never heard of quarantine. I guess my brain couldn't remember quarantine. Brand up for San Jose, California. Uh, to institute the first in-nation gun ownership requirements. San Jose is set to become the first city to enforce an ordinance requiring most gun owners to pay a fee and carry liability insurance. In a statement, Mayor Sam Licardo said the city council had voted in both favor of both methods, which are aimed at reducing the risk of gun harm and relieving taxpayers of the financial cost of gun violence. Way to go. Um, brand up for my friend Michael Rappaport, old friend, good friend of mine, old friend of the show. He did the show. Um, he posted a clip on TikTok, and this is a big problem that's going on in New York, that what's happened is, he said, I, I can't believe I'm seeing this shit. This motherfucker, this fucking guy, just filled his two bags up with everything in Rite Aid, right here on 80th Street and 1st Avenue, and just walked out on, you know, basically stealing. What's happened in New York is people are going into drugstores, thieves, loading up on stuff, just getting their shampoo and this and that, and they walk out. And because they know even if they call the police, the police are not going to do anything. This is where it's gotten to in New York, where they can't, the police are going to say, look, we'll just bring them in. They're going to put them right out. There's nothing we can do. So these, these drugstores are just getting robbed blind. And, and Michael Rappaport did a video of this showing a guy walking out. And it got, you know, uh, uh, it, got, it got shown virally over 600,000 views. And it's really a crazy thing that's going on in New York now, but Michael Rappaport doing his right thing. A big brand down from the McMinn County, Tennessee School Board. It banned Holocaust graphic novel, Mouse. And Mouse, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning book that they banned from the school because from eighth grade language arts, they said concerns about profanity and image of female nudity and depiction of Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust. Mouse depicts Jews as mice and the cats are Nazi Germans. What a notorious history of banning and burning books. Um, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning book, but too uh, too much for kids, for middle school kids to learn about the Holocaust and uh, scary, scary, scary stuff. Brand up for Amy Schneider. 
Historic Jeopardy uh, win comes as a streak. 40, she won 40 games. She's the second winningest after, of course, um, uh, Ken Jennings. She won $1.4 million. Imagine winning 40 Jeopardy things in a row. You know how smart you have to be? But there you go. Brand up for uh, my friends at Morning Joe and for my friend Stephanie Rule. Uh, Morning Joe is expanding to a fifth, if you include way too early, a fifth hour. And Stephanie Rule had been doing the nine o'clock in the morning, which now Morning Joe will take over. And Stephanie got a big bump up. She's taking Brian Williams' spot in the 11 o'clock at night. So uh, a big win for Morning Joe, a big win for Steph Rule. And got it. I love both. I uh, love the folks at Morning Joe, obviously. And I love Steph Rule. She's a good friend of mine. Brand up for uh, Seth Myers. It's the 40th anniversary of The Late Show, and he's having on David Letterman, who, of course, uh, basically was first in that spot, that 1230 spot on NBC. Um, and that's where he kind of got launched into 1130. He didn't get the 1130 spot on NBC. That went to Leno famously, and he went, went over to CBS. But Seth Myers is is having um, Letterman on to celebrate the 40th year, and I think that's going to be must-see TV. Brand up for David Ortiz. He got into the Hall of Fame and brand down for Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens because they didn't. This was their 10th try and they didn't get in, of course, because of steroids. And, I, you know, I'm very torn on it. I actually, you know, a lot of people say, look, the, the Hall of Baseball Hall of Fame is about the history of baseball. And how can you have the history of baseball without including Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and put them in plaques, put, you know, asterisks next to it, tell the story. Um, there are a lot of, you know, nefarious characters in the Hall of Fame. I mean, Ty Cobb was race, you know, a lot of racists in the Hall of Fame. Um, and a lot of people believe, and I'm starting to come around, they should be in there, but with an asterisk, as opposed to uh, not being in there. So a lot of people are coming on both sides of that. Brand up for legal marijuana. For the first time, Massachusetts marijuana excise tax revenue exceeds alcohol. So that's all you need to know about why marijuana is going to eventually be uh, legal in every state. The tax revenues for Massachusetts for pot now exceed the tax revenues for alcohol. So always follow the money. Uh, brand up for the SAT, this classic aptitude test that you take to get into college. It's going from three hours to two, and it's going to be all digital. A lot of colleges don't require it anymore, and I think that's a good idea. You know, it, it really skews against uh, lower income kids because kids from more privileged homes take all these courses and tests and, and consultants and, you know, all these, all this prep stuff where young people that don't, I mean, I mean, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds that don't have the means to do that are at a disadvantage. So I think they should get rid of the SATs all, all of a sudden. Brand up for Bank of America, uh, giving workers 1 billion of stock. Um, Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan said Tuesday, the company is for the first time opening up its stock awards program to lower level employees who make up to hundred grand a year. This is the way they're going to keep employees. People can't keep employees today and good for them. Brand up for Warren Buffett. Okay, last month was a, was a very rough month in the stock market and there were 10 wealthiest people in the world, lost $158 billion. He was the only one that didn't lose money. I mean, that's he's just smarter than the rest. It's incredible. Uh, brand, depends whether you're, you're, you're into people, health or not. If you're a health conscious person, brand down. If you love, really gluttonous food brand up at McDonald's. It's combining the Big Mac, a McChicken, and a filet fish into one giant sandwich. It's new land, air, and sea combined. <laughs> it's 1,330 calories. And I'm trying to picture how that would taste. A filet fish a McChicken, and a, and a burger together. Why not, right? Only 1,330 calories. So we're going to give a brand, uh, what the heck, for McDonald's. Brand up for Anheuser-Busch. It's interesting. They're returning to the Super Bowl, but... They're not going to be just serving beer anymore. It shows where the company's going. Beer becomes a small and smaller part of their business. Their 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 ads for Bud Night, a Bud Light Next, a zero carb spinoff, a Bud Light Seltzer Hard Soda, uh, also Cut Water Spirits, a line of canned cocktails and the brand's first national commercial, Michelob Ultra Organic Hard Seltzer. So you know these companies are moving away from beer consumption is dropping compared to their hard seltzer and these alternative alcoholic beverage. So brand and. Uh, Brand up for Anheuser-Busch. And there you go. And those are our brands of the week. Now you're going to really enjoy my interview with Huma Abedin and take a listen. I want to talk to you about Blinkist. B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist is here to empower people to grow personally and professionally by discovering content that inspires, motivates, and gives new perspectives on their lives in the world in 2022. 
Blinkist is the perfect content to help you be a better, smarter, and more knowledgeable you in 2022. Now, what it does is it aggregates titles of, of all these books to help your life better, to really improve your life. And it gives you little synopsis. So you go on this one place, Blinkist, and it basically, let's say I'm interested in a book and oh, I heard about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I heard it's a book about how to learn how to make money. It kind of gives you the, a little five, 10 minute synopsis of it. So if you know, if you want to buy the book, and so, you know, some of the books on there, Think and Grow Rich, Your Best Year Ever, High Performance Habits, Unshakable, Seven Strategies for Wealth and Happiness. So all books about self-help and betterment and making money and being a better you. And you go on there, they list every book, they give you a synopsis of every book, and then you decide the books you want to get. So I think it's really, really smart. Now Blinkist has a special offer for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Donnie to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off Blinkist Premium Membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Donnie to get 25% off in a seven-day free trial, Blinkist.com slash Donnie. I want to talk to you about Indeed. And if you're hiring people, you need Indeed. In 2022, don't let the search for the best candidates slow down your growth. Find quality candidates fast with Indeed. If you're hiring, you need Indeed because Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. And Indeed is the only job site where you're guaranteed to find quality applications that meet your must-have requirements or else you don't pay. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites, Indeed is the hiring partner you need. It's all there. It takes you through every step of the hiring process, find great talent through time-saving tools like Indeed, Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. With Instant Match, as soon as you sponsor a post, you get a short list of quality candidates with resumes on Indeed that match your job description. You can invite them to apply right away. Plus, you only pay for quality applications that meet your must-have requirements. Delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined. Join more than three million businesses worldwide that have used Indeed to hire great talent. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash onbrand. Offer valid through March 31st. Go to Indeed.com slash onbrand to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Indeed.com slash brand. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire. You need Indeed. I am thrilled at today's guest. Uh, I've only met her briefly a couple of times in passing in restaurants in New York City. Um, Huma Abedin is uh, kind of a household person at this point. Um, she has been Hillary's uh, go-to side person, advisor, chief of staff, um, all things Hillary. Uh, of course, has, has uh, lived through um, tabloid uh, stuff with her ex-husband, Anthony Weiner, that everybody knows too well. And she's just a fascinating person. And she's got a new bestseller, both and a life in many worlds. Uh, it really is divided into kind of four parts, you know, her childhood in Saudi Arabia, her Muslim faith, her time as an aide to Clinton and, and her time with Anthony Weiner. And we're going to kind of get into all of it. But first, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Donnie, I'm thrilled to be talking to you. Thank you for having me. Now, the first question I ask everybody, and I'm really, and I've thought in my mind how I would answer this if I was you, what's the Huma brand? You know, we lens everything that, the whole premise of this show is that everybody, everything, every celebrity, every politician, every, every everything is a brand. So what's your brand, would you say at this point? That, that's a tough one. I No yeah. one's asked me that question, but I think for me, my brand, I hope to some extent will always be, I think mom is maybe the most important job I've had and will always have. Yeah. But secondly, the notion of public service, the idea that no matter what you do, if you're somebody like me, it's in your bones. Yeah. That, that the call, that call to public service, there's nothing, there's nothing like it. You can't describe it, Donnie, unless you have been in those rooms, in those town halls, in people's homes, walking those rope lines, touching people, you're carrying people's hopes, dreams, aspirations, and fears with you when you're on a campaign and then to think that if you are successful, you can do something about that. Yeah. It's nothing like it. Where'd that come from? I mean, I, there's a letter at the beginning of the book from your father that I think has informed a lot of who you are. And I could see traces of it. And I want to talk about that. Where, so where does that, where does it, we're not all born with that. Where we don't, you know, where, where does that come from? You know, I do think it's genetic. It's weird for me to say that. But I think, you know, for my father's side of the family, it was a long line of public servants. Sure. The same for my mother's side of the family. And I think also so much of how we become adults is what we see modeled for us. And ever since I was a little girl, my parents were always doing, I mean, working on an, a thought institute, you know, teaching um, 
women in Saudi Arabia, educating them. There's constantly this notion of giving back to the community, of serving other people, of trying to help um, other people. And so I just kind of picked up. And Donnie, I also believe that so much of my life has been a combination of fate, hard work, but also just luck. You know, just I walked into the Clinton White House and fell in love with the cause. I wasn't even a Democrat. I don't, you know, luck, I could say luck, but yet something about you, you were a GW, which by the way, my daughter just got accepted to, which is you know, Georgia University. So I'm, love it. I, I'm love so it. excited. It feels so right for her. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, you do, you come right out of there and all of a sudden you, you're working for Hillary Clinton. So that's not luck. There's something that obviously the, the Clintons are pretty sharp people and Hillary is, is one of the smartest people in the world. And so, and from that mm-hmm. point on, you were kind of at her side. So I don't, mm-hmm. I wouldn't call that luck. Well, I did bring a different perspective. You know, when I walked into the White House in 1996, September 1996, and I was still a, you know, I was still at George Washington University. I was a senior there. And I know your daughter is going to experience this as well. One of the best things about being in school in Washington is that you were literally immersed in government and journalism. I mean, you're, you're, you know, it's just such an incredible place. And I couldn't have had the White House internship if uh, I hadn't gone to GW, but I did have a different perspective. And I think people saw that there weren't a lot of women like me who'd been raised in the Middle East, who was, you know, there were very few Muslim Americans Mm -hmm. who traveled the world. I mean, places Hillary was going as first lady, I had been to with my parents because they really instilled in us a love, curiosity about the world and traveling places. Um, Every time my son comes to me and says, mom, you know, I f- saw this on TikTok or I saw this YouTube video. It, it hurts my heart a little bit because I would love to put Jordan on a plane and take him to Thailand, yeah. not have him watch a YouTube video. And, yeah. and that's how I was raised. And you talked to me about that letter that your dad wrote. It, it's at the mm-hmm. beginning of the book. And it, it it really kind of, you kind of read that and you kind of go, okay, I got it. I got it. I got who this person is or why, yeah, well, why you know, she that- is and where she is and why she's done what she's done. And I found that letter after my father died. And I write he died when you were young, when you were 16. When you I were, was 17, 17. When I was two, he was diagnosed with renal failure. He managed to get a kidney transplant. And he lived until I was 17, which is an amazing gift for him to have gotten that transplant and for me to get to know my father. And I was, you know, very, very, I mean, he was my hero. He sort of dipped in, you know, amber and put on a pedestal forever. He was you know, defiant. He was, you know, provocative. He always forced us to like have conversations with the other. But after he died, I went home to Saudi Arabia and I found this note and I opened the book with it. And I think it was basically a diary note, but I believe it was a letter that he essentially wrote to me, which basically said, you know, you let others say what they will. You are responsible in the first instance to yourself, your principles and values, and ultimately to your God, your higher power. And that is how you have to make your way in the world. That's how he did it. And that's what I have tried to do. He was always motivated by just trying to do the next right thing. And every decision in my life, personal and professional, Mm -hmm. I've tried to follow that model. And you get the GW as a a young Muslim woman. And and being a Muslim woman in this country 25 years ago, I would imagine is very different than today. And today, obviously, still has its challenges. And I live in New York City, and and as do you, it, it we don't live in a big chunk of this country where there's still uh, all kinds of connotations that come with it. But 25 years ago, different game. Different game. You're the first person to ask me this, and I appreciate it. It was a curiosity, and it was an interesting curiosity to people, and certainly the wor- environment I was in. It yeah. was. Oh, what you don't you don't eat all day? Explain that. Yeah. Oh, you believe in Jesus and Moses? There was a curiosity and there, but there was not the underlying, hmm, what really do you believe? And I was in the White House, uh, you know, for, for, well, actually I wasn't there in 93 for the first uh, um, World Trade Center attempted bombing, but I was there when we had the attacks on our embassies in Tanzania and Kenya. I was obviously in government during 9-11. Oh, obviously Benghazi. And the whole world changed. And yeah. and the way my family, my community was viewed, there was always this. And I have to tell you, post Michelle Bachman's attack on me and, um, and Benghazi, absolutely I have felt that there are times I walk into spaces and places and like, well, what do you really, yeah. do you really want to bring Sharia law to this country? Yeah, and, yeah. And I have to roll my eyes, but it, it, it changed. 
exceptionally in the last 25 years in a negative way. Yeah, I have to tell you, and, and I live in a liberal circle and I, I, I still find with some of my suburban friends who are Republicans, who are, and these are educated people, mm. that there is a, a uh, anti-Semitic, Quality there, there, there is a racist. There is a uh, I, I don't know what the word is for anti-Muslim, but yeah. still an ignorance with yeah. being Muslim and what that means, yeah. and that some, somehow there's there's dotted lines to terrorists, and that it's you're 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 anti-Jewish, and that you're anti-this, and it's just this isn't an educated world I live in, and it's still we've come far, but we still have so far to go, and you obviously live that. Amen to everything you just said and this idea that we have become the other. You know, in yeah. 2016, when I was traveling around the country on behalf of the campaign, warning people about, and warning my community, actually. I was going and talking yeah. to Muslim community members and Arab community members and young people and saying, this is a real threat. Imagine if this Muslim ban is put into effect and people do not take it seriously. They just didn't think. But they successfully, and I, I would argue led by Donald Trump and the Republican Party at the time, they successfully, and, and Michelle Bachman, in my opinion, when she attacked me and other I'm so happy her name is not mentioned anymore. I mean, I <laughs> like, it's like we, we have our, we have, our, we have Marjorie, we have Marjorie Taylor Green. We, we've got people who've taken her place, but it's like, oh yeah, but Michelle anyway, Bachman, that fucking psycho. You know what I mean? But, but they planted a seed. Yeah, they planted that. I argue in my book that in 2012, that those accusations against those Muslim Americans in government, which included me, was a uh, 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 basically seeded. What they didn't successfully do with President Obama in 2008, remember what they tried to do sure, with him in 2008. He's an Arab, he's a Muslim, That's right. making him the other. Tried again in 2012, and it worked in 2016, Donnie. It really did. We became the other. My community became the other. Yeah. And I agree with you. I mean, look at what happened to the synagogue the other day. I mean, it's not, unfortunately, just Muslims, but it is religious minorities um, in this country. And it's very, very scary. What's well, so scary, and, and not just for Muslims, but for any other, and I'm a Jew, and, and throughout history, Jews have been another, and yeah, that absolutely. Trump, and I've said this on the air two and three years ago, and I got a lot of shit for it, and I made the Hitler comparisons, and I made the Mussolini comparisons, that it, it's the dictator playbook, and you start, the simple starting point is the other, is you yeah. create another, and you look at there are enough unhappy people and you say to the unhappy people, it's not your fault. It's the brown person's fault. It's the Muslim's fault. It's the banker's fault. It's this fault. And everything goes from there. And then you distort what facts are and you go from there. And it's a simple playbook. And I, you know, I got a lot of shit on MSNBC. I think I had, I had my own show on Saturday night and I believe to this day, one of the reasons that it got canceled because the numbers were through the roof is that they felt some of the powers that be I was going too far. And now it's very vogue to make those comparisons and as well they should be post January 6th. You know, I um, I write in the book a lot about what it was like being in the Clinton White House yeah. and, and this idea that back then you could argue that America was the sole superpower in the 90s. And you had a first lady actively engaged in championing women's rights around the world. You had a president actively overseeing a robust economy. And people look back now and say, oh, wow, those were golden years. Obviously, we all lived through impeachment. I write sure. about how painful yeah. that was and how hard that was. But Donnie, the, the divide in our parties, you could argue, actually started in full force in that era, the era of Newt Gingrich, the attacks. Sure. The, Contract we, America, were yeah. a, we were divided, but, but there's a big but here. We pushed forward. We worked together. I mean, Hillary Clinton went to the Senate and started working with people who said horrible things about her family, her daughter. Yeah. But she did it. Well, Bill was the same way. Bill was, one thing about Bill Clinton is you could, you could shit all over him one day and the next day he's shaking your hand, let's make a deal. And that, that's, that's what one of his talents were. And that, that's in those, the Clinton genes, the two of them. And, and it's the notion of if you love your country and you want to help, I mean, that is why I always felt that in the previous administration, was it about the American people or was it about oneself? And I feel like the difference, at least in, you know, I'm a Democrat, obviously, working for President Obama, working for the Clintons, that it was, I will not, I will ignore the nonsense mm -hmm. because I want to get, you know, get some stuff done. Now that has also worked to a negative effect when yeah. you ignore the nonsense. Yeah. People, you know, fake news becomes truth. Yeah. Um, 
And that's just the world we live in now with, uh, with social media and the 24 second news cycle. I want to talk to you about NordVPN, uh, N-O-R-D VPN. And VPN, this is to protect your privacy. You, you, don't, you know, all, everything you're texting, everything you email is so, e- when you're not in a safe place, it's so easy to be stolen. For instance, when I'm traveling, I'm often unsecure airport or restaurant Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi is notorious for being a hotbed for hackers to steal data. By using NordVPN on my phone, laptop, and iPad, this protects me from hackers and gives me peace of mind while I'm traveling. I hear people say VPNs have a reputation for slowing down your internet speed, but not with NordVPN because it's the fastest VPN in the world. You don't have to sacrifice internet speed. Internet traffic is routed through a secure encrypted tunnel, which protects your data and privacy. You can also NordVPN have you up on six devices your laptop, your phone, your smart TV, iPad, even your router. So all your devices are protected with NordVPN. It's equivalent to buying a cup of coffee every month. It does not cost that much. A small price to pay for premium cybersecurity and access to vast amounts of entertaining content. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee if NordVPN is not for you and there's no risk. Go to nordvpn.com slash Donnie or use the code Donnie to get up to 70% off your NordVPN plan plus one additional month for free. It's also risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Once again, Nord VPN, N-O-R-D VPN. This will keep all your stuff secure. Check it out. I, I really believe in it. I want to talk about Miz and Maine, and I'm a clothes guy. So I know a lot about clothes and shopping and fashion. By the way, I want to spell it M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. And my dress shirts used to always be stiff and make me sweat and wrinkle easily. And I also used hate, hated wearing dress shirts. But now with Mizzen and Maine, they've got all this unique stuff where they've got these lightweight shirts that don't wrinkle and they've got casual wear and it's, it's super comfortable stuff. And if you have to wear a dress shirt, Mizzen and Maine is the, place, is the place to go. And if you're looking for casual stuff, they got all kinds of stuff. You can skip the dry cleaner. They're machine washable. Uh, on a hot day in D.C., Mizzen and Maine's found this sort of guy running up the hill in a sweat-soaked, wrinkled dress shirt and thought there had to be a better way. Since then, they've set out to make being comfortable and looking great. And, and looking great as the new normal. Uh, makes incredibly comfortable flannels, no tuck shirts, performance polos, chinos, so much more. Performance fabrics with modern tailoring. They've got 30,000 reviews. They've got a 30,000 five-star reviews. Um, with work from wherever being the new normal, I love that Miz and Maine fits with whatever my work situation is. I'm telling you, Miz and Maine, if you got to wear shirts, Miz and Maine. So whether you're working from the golf course or taking conference calls in the courtyard, Got good news right now. If you go to Mizzen and Main, that's M I Z Z E N and Main.com and use promo code Donnie, you receive 35 bucks off any regular price order of $125 or more. That's $35 off when you go to M I Z Z E N A N D M A I N.com and use your promo code Donnie. You won't be disappointed. So I just want to take it up 10,000 feet for a second. You, you're somebody who, and you, by your own admission, is was all about service and you are always the the person, people always talk for years, they never heard your voice. You were in the background. And yeah. writing this book does anything but keep you in the background. So what, what was, and, and it, the book is riveting. And, and guys, if you haven't read it, this is, this is a must read. But so what made you write it? I, um, I, maybe because I'm talking to you, this is coming out, but I, uh, it was the first, um, I never thought I would write my book. I mm-hmm. liked being the invisible person. I mm-hmm. liked being behind the scenes. Um, and right after the 2016 election, when half the country was just devastated by the outcome, I, I went to dinner with, uh, with Anna Winter. I've already mentioned that she, the book was her idea. Right. She said, you know, I know what you should do next. You should write, it's a great story. You should write your book. And I mentioned it to Hillary a couple of days later. And she says, great idea. And I thought, no way I'm never going to do it. I'd like, I wanted to just, not only did I want to go back into my shell, I wanted the world to open up and for me to just fall into it and disappear. Like that is how broken yeah, and shattered yeah, I was. Yeah. And it, honestly, it was only about seven months later when I mentioned it to somebody else, on, you know, who I knew not as well. And they said, why would, you write, why would you write the book? No one wants to read anymore about that scandal. And it was only when somebody dismissed the story and, and that it made me want to do it. Mm-hmm. And I I'd at least started vomiting on paper and putting my thoughts down. And once I started... I loved the process. Yeah. I loved writing. It was great therapy. Mm-hmm. People say to me all the time, how could you write about all that horrible stuff? Actually, I really loved writing it. And some of it actually is, is so crazy. It's almost like reading fiction. Like you can't make 
make some of this stuff up. Yeah. That was actually fact in, no, in, in my life. Your life is just incredible. White House, yeah, yeah. the 2008 campaign, yeah. I have the 2016 campaign, obviously, and, and my marriage. It's just, it's crazy. And so I've loved it. And I've loved being on a book tour, surprisingly. Fun. I didn't anticipate that. Let's talk a little bit about, about Brand Hillary. Because one mm. one thing, and you, I, I remember always talking on the air, going that, why are they not showing the Hillary, the Hillary that you would know better than anybody? Uh, I mean, yeah. obviously, but the Hillary in the future, I probably met Hillary a half a dozen times, whatnot, and just engaging, and the people that work for her would say like, oh my God, you don't know this about her, and this about her, and this, and why, and uh, I'm not blaming Mark Penn or whoever, any of they're like, mm. Why did that not translate? Why, why was that never able to come out, whether it was her inability to put it out, whether it was people's inability to take it in? Because that Hillary, had that Hillary been shown, Hillary would be president of the United States. There's no question about it. Regardless, even forget any silly email story. Mm. That Why did that not come out? You know, in 2008, when she first got into the race and we had looked at research saying that it was going to be hard for a woman, we knew that, that it was hard for people to see a woman in an executive leadership position, certainly commander in chief. And so really the goal was every time she was on TV, every time she was out in the world was to show strength, look presidential, was, to, yeah, yeah. was to look presidential. And and nobody doubted that this woman was brilliant because she was. So she'd yeah. go on stage, not, you know, right in the story, but we'd be laughing backstage and she would tease us and say, how was your date last night? Yeah, right. You know, what are we going to do for dinner tonight? And then she'd go on stage and it would be this. Yeah. And, and she would just be, um, you know, she would be presidential and and serious and... um. And we thought that was the right way to be, that you had to, you had to be everything a man was going to be and, and better and mm -hmm. more. And in 2016, I mean, honestly, it was to epic level. And part of it was we did ignore the story. So every time there was a story, you know, in, two, in 1996, with the dawn of 24-hour cable news, mm -hmm. We were um, constantly in every day one proactive message. So if it was healthcare, every day healthcare, healthcare. I didn't. We ignored that Chelsea, Chelsea had an alien sibling. Mm -hmm. We ignored all the nonsense yeah. because we didn't want that sure. to take over the time. You can't live like that anymore. No. And we started learning that in 2016. So when somebody said Hillary's dying, the fact that we ignored it, which by the way we did, right. all this stuff we thought no one's going to believe. Yeah, but people ended up believing. So you had the nonsense kind of raising up this way. P, the the constant barbs and frankly the attacks when somebody says to every single day lock her up even if you are a multiple times a day even if you are a thinking rational person mm -hmm. there's something in the back of your head saying hmm did she do something and I think we could never get past that narrative and I think emails as you well know yeah. was a story that was very hard to get beyond every time she went on Fallon or she might do your show sure. people saw sure. Hillary yeah but. It was just hard. That balancing act was hard and, and proved to be not impossible because in the end, she did win more votes. It was yeah. just the way our system works, you know, in the 77,000 people in three states. It, it is incredible. Why also, I always wondered about her brand, that mm. women were so polarized about Hillary. Yeah. You know, and one, one thing that is interesting is that a woman in power has to deal with how men are going to perceive her in power and obviously how equally important how women are going to perceive her in power. But Hillary always, and I was always astounded that just in my mother-in-law research, as I would talk to tens and 20 and hundreds of women, like you had this, this passion about Hillary uh, mm. in pro, and then you had some women that just were allergic to it. And I don't know if they were threatened yeah. by her or threatened by women in power. Break that down for me. It is, uh, if you can figure out the, the answer to this or the solution to this, um, uh, I would owe you and the world might owe you because- you know, when you close this book, I hope anybody objectively could read this book and see what an extraordinary leader this woman is and, and yeah. was. And I, I, I think that it's been a, it's a great disservice to the history of our country that she didn't get the honor to serve uh, as president because that's how exceptional she is. Um, we knew we had this challenge. I mean, we ha we have a the, you know we have a challenge. I think in our party now, particularly white women, that they are, you know, in. Hearing stories on the road, like there would be people, we would do door knocking in early states and women would open the door 
and um, and and they and and they would say, "Who are you voting for?" And the husband would come to the front and say, "We're voting for the man." And they would whisper, yeah. oh, "Don't worry, I'm going to support Hillary." Yeah. I I I cannot. It's a psychological thing. I think they just can't. Whether it's competition, whether it's the judgment, it's the judge if you stay, judge if you go. I certainly dealt with that in in as I was trying to figure out my marriage. Women who were upset because I stayed. Women who were upset, yeah. you know, because I didn't, you know. It is, it is 100% a mystery. And by the way, I think it's a generational thing. The only way we change, I'm raising a 10-year-old son. I am raising that boy to respect women, but also not fear their power. Yeah. Because yeah. this is a psychological, conscious and subconscious thing, the way our, our world is. And we have to break it. What you've obviously spent a lot of time with Hillary post Donald Trump. Here you have the irony of, as one mm-hmm. of the most accomplished, equipped, uh, credentialized person to be running this country who lo- loses, loses in the Electoral College at least, to a bozo, to somebody who was by far the most, Ill, wherever your politics are, the most ill-equipped person as from a job spec point of view to run. How has Hillary since processed that, lived with that, if I asked her this question, what would her answer be? Because obviously this is something that she lives with every day and it's one of the great travesties in political history. So how would she answer that? You know, I think one of the reasons um, Hillary Clinton has been so successful in her life is that I think a quality that she has, this amazing quality, um, which is something my parents had and something they taught me, and I think it's one of the reasons why I have stayed for a quarter of a century, is radical empathy. That's a great set of words, radical empathy. That's a great set of words. She really has believed, never believed it's about her. Always, always can try and put herself in someone else's shoes. Always thinks, and I very much believe this, every single day, even people, you know, it was funny, I I was um, out with somebody, uh, uh, you know, about about six months ago. And I sit down at this dinner and I just met this man. And he turns to me and he says, well, your life has sucked. And that was, you know, his opening line. And I thought, no. Fuck you. Fuck you. First of all, you should say, <laughs> fuck you at that point, okay? You should only be lucky enough to have had my life, right? But, okay. yeah. but that's my point, yeah. is that both she and I can look at our, every day we get up and we're healthy and we're successful and whole. We, we are extraordinarily privileged. And I think that is the very first thing she said to me when she gave her concession speech, November 2016, that morning, that horrible morning, when we were so shattered, when we had failed our country, failed our children, and certainly failed the woman. Our we country thought failed ourselves funny. at that point, frankly. So, I mean, I, but, I, I or, agree or, with you, or, actually. Or, or. She walks up stage. The very first thing she says to me as she's looking at all of her staff shattered in the audience is, I have to figure out how to help everybody get back on their feet. Yeah. Let me know what I can do. I mean, from that moment, it was about how do I make somebody else's life better? And that is how she has moved forward. It is. How do I help the party? How do I help the next nominee? And 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 she doesn't say this, but can I tell you how many times over those four years I would email her or text her and say, didn't you say this? Didn't you? As you said, yeah. as you said, when yeah. she was wandering around the country in 2016 saying this was the most important election, talk Supreme Court, climate change, you name yeah. it, Donnie. Right. Yeah. Nailed it. I mean, it's eerie now. Do you remember the moment at night and you talk about a moment where Hillary screamed out can, around 10 o'clock at night, can somebody tell me what's going on? Yeah. Do you take me through the moment where you, because I remember just as a as an omniscient observer and a viewer and a voter and a citizen feeling what was happening. Do you remember a specific moment where you said, holy shit? Because that morning, everybody was kind of bullish and, you know, like she was up a few points in the polls, which she's, mm. frankly, the poll, the national polls were right. You know, I mean, they, they had... But do you remember the, a specific moment where you went, holy shit, this is, this is not going to happen for us and Donald Trump's going to be president? I think I was actually in disbelief that night. But to take people back, your, your listeners back a little bit, I was nervous the minute um, the Comey announcement was made 11 days yeah. before the election. I mean, yeah. that was the moment you know, I, the, the, the announcement was made. I, I, mean, I went, you know, back to campaign headquarters to offer my resignation. Um, and I, you know, I called a, a few of the experts after our campaign manager. And this idea that it was an election so close 
every little thing mattered. And this was a huge thing. And then to have the second announcement two days before. So I went into election day very, very nervous. Uh, I, I, you know, all, all, everybody was obviously putting a very good front and certainly people were very bullish about it. But so to me, when it was, I actually saw it happening, as you saw the, you know, early states were coming in, all the places we, we knew we were going to win. Virginia was good news. But then as it was coming in 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and as Robbie and John Podesta, you know, our campaign manager and chair started coming in with less good news, I think I was, I, I had so much anger that night. I mean, it was just, I, and disbelief. And she was a little bit of a shock too, but it, to some extent, I had been waiting for it all week. You know, no, it was sort of, thing. Jen Palmari had said to me that the early voting was so through the roof and the emails, oh, it, yeah. it, it just, it, you could just see it. It, it just, you it just fell off it. a cliff. I, I, I it mean, fell off. And, Philadelphia suburbs. I mean, we'd have actual numbers to show what that announcement yeah. did. I so, mean, and, it, and it, it's something I, that's something I have to live with. For so the yeah, let's, let's very, talk very about hard. that. Obviously you're, you were at the epicenter of that you didn't, this is nothing you caused, but you, you were part of it. You're, you're, we, we, everybody knows the history. We don't have to relitigate it. In order. Yeah. So you literally live with, okay, maybe things were different with my husband. The emails don't happen. Donald Trump doesn't. I, I mean, it is that grand. Uh, and so what do you, where do you, how do we process it? What do we do? And you, you, you use the word fate earlier on. Mm. And you also, you kind of, and there's got to be a piece of you because you're such a decent human being. And you go, okay, wait a second, how, how the fuck did, did this happen that I was a piece of and why would this, like, like where, where, your brain, my brain explodes talking to you about it. So where do you, how do you process this? Where, what's, where's, where's the cathar? And I, I guess writing the book has helped it. And this is yeah. not about, oh, something that you and your husband did or your husband did cause the, but, but there's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I mean, just what we talked about. So where do we put this? Where do we put all this? Well, I think for me, I'm a faith. I'm so glad for me that I have faith. Um, I think that certainly my faith saved me. I mean, Muslim prayer is essentially a meditation, stepping back from the world, just shutting everything out and reflecting on your thoughts, deeds, and intentions. And I think that definitely helped carry me through. But Donnie, I went through a very, very bad low place. I had a, you know, I had a five-year-old um, at the time, and I think that got me out of bed. Um, in the mornings, but I, I carried a lot of guilt. Um, and I had to, and at one point, this book was actually called Letting Go. Mm -hmm. I had to get, I had so much anger, so much regret, so much bitterness towards Anthony, obviously at the time, and just over what had happened. You know, I had, I had, I had cooperated in this FBI investigation. I yeah. had, you know, gone in several times to have conversations. I mean, I, I whatever you need, I will yeah. do. Yeah. And, um, and to feel so helpless, to just be kind of in the middle of all of this and to feel so helpless. And in the end, I needed professional help because I got to a very low place. I mean, a place where I, I really pretty much almost you talked about You talked about you were standing on a subway platform and you, I, you thought I, about I, taking, yeah, taking a jump. I did, I did for a brief second. And then when I thought it, standing on that subway platform, I mean, even now when I go on that train, it comes back to me sometimes. Right. I'm standing on that subway platform. The fact that I thought, that's when I knew I needed help. Yeah. Just that I was having those thoughts. And I'm glad I did. And I got professional help. I would have not made it through without. And I had to, and it was brutal. I mean, the process was brutal. Learning the truth was brutal, but I needed to. And, uh, and, it, and it has really, I felt a sense of relief and I do. And I'm constantly working on myself and, you know, working with the father of my child because you have to. But yes, you do have it to. It hasn't been easy. And there are reminders, constantly reminders. God, yeah. there are reminders. But what would you tell you, your, your son Jordan's 10? Let's say you had a, a daughter. Mm -hmm. And in hindsight, how would you tell your daughter to navigate the way you navigate a different, same, goes through the same thing, marries a guy, you know, a Prince Charming. Uh, she's Muslim. She's innocent. Mm -hmm. This is her first real man. Stands by him, once again, the, the, the incidents uh, that happened over several years, uh, that happened a few times. What would you tell your daughter? I wish, it's funny that I'm having this conversation with you and you're asking me questions that no one has asked me, but- well, That's a good thing, I guess. I, so. I, it is a very good thing. I wish somebody, I, I wish I'd had an intervention. I really yeah. do. And I think- 
you know, there's something about, you know, I write in the book about being raised in a world where there's a very strong sense of community, you know, and, and it's good. There are pluses and minuses like this in the Islamic world. It's called the Ummah. It's like, we're all in each other's business. Yeah. A wedding, funeral, we're all there. And, and it's a little, it's a different, it's different in America. And even though I had a very close professional, uh, you know, group of friends, obviously, um, there's this, there's always this sense of respect. Like, I'm going to give you your space and your respect. I didn't understand what was happening. I was so new to relationships. I waited for the perfect yeah. man. I thought he'd come, you know, it, it was amazing, but I wish somebody, and I write this in the book had said, he has a problem. It's not going to just go away. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and you and got, and you got, when you look back, do you, did you realize that? Or you were just kind of like, no, this is the way I deal with it. And, and this explanation. And, and do you, cause we always have that little tummy voice, you know? Uh, and do you look back now and go, the tummy voice was there or the tummy voice wasn't there. And it, and that's why you needed the intervention. The tummy voice was probably there. I think yeah. there was something, there was always something that, you know, once you have a betrayal in a relationship, I suspect any couple that goes through this, there's always this, you never know. Yeah. But what I didn't know was that this was not, you know, I didn't know anything about compulsive behavior, about addiction, about narcissism, all the things that, you know, my spouse was then struggling with. So I was in a much more knock it off, let's move on with our lives, you know, run for mayor, let's yeah. just try to get back on our feet as opposed to let's really try and understand this um, because it uh, it changed our lives. And, and I, I, I'm not blaming anybody. I don't think people knew what to do. Yeah. But I do wish there was somebody who banged on my door and said, instead of going to Anthony and saying, let's figure out how to mm -hmm. rehab you. Let's figure out, yeah. you know, let's do some focus groups. They should have been like, let's really try to understand this. Um, Part of it, it's it. interesting. I asked you about your brand and- your brand is so much about service and servicing the other person that you probably had you been more narcissistic yourself. And I mean that in this positive sense of the word. And had you ever been a more, you know, whoma comes first, or I don't like, it might've changed. It's interesting. The very thing that has made you so powerful and successful professionally bit you, bit you personally. Yeah. And that's a little armchair psychology, but it's interesting as I'm talking yeah, to you and I'm right. listening to you. It, it, that's right. I wish I had been more selfish. I wish I had been more. And I think that's how I'm uh, sort of approaching the new me. It's, it is, you know, I think, and maybe this is something women do. It's always about the other. You know, my, when I first wrote the proposal for the book, I wrote my whole life. I have been a refraction of somebody else's pronoun. They, yeah. as in my parents, she, as in Hillary, and he, as in Anthony. And, and the last part of the book, you know, where I write suffering, the chapter suffering is optional. Right is about me reclaiming myself, my own identity, and figuring out who I'm going to be when I grow up. You know, it, it's interesting you talk about the the woman part of that. I've written a couple of books. And Mike, when I was running my agency, nine of my 11 senior partners were women. And this was in the 90s. This was long, wow. long before. Wow, that's amazing. Because it was a meritocracy. And I also realized that I wrote a chapter in one of my books, and I called The Female Superiority Doctrine, in that if you gave me a woman and a man of the same exact, talent, if, you, if there was such a thing as, okay, every IQ, any measurement, the only difference was gender, I would take the woman every time. And he was the reason why. If you watch a Saturday morning TV commercial for a little girl's game, at the, it, it always ends with the girls playing together. And mm. if you watch a boy's game or toy commercial, one boy raises his hand and go, and go, I won. And I always found in business, men I dealt with, alpha males, Bill Clinton recognized this also, we're always pounding on it's a zero-sum game. What, how big is my office? How big is my this? How big? Mm. Whereas I found women, this was just through my learning, working 25, 30 years, were so much more focused on the task and not how much is in it for me, what's in it for me. Yeah. And of course, this is a grotesque generalization, but it's what I found in the business world and what made me so successful was being surrounded by almost exclusively women, powerful women. I um, happen to agree with you. I mean, I, it's one of the things I think is pretty amazing about Hillary is that, you know, she is one of those people who is not scared of other people who might be smart. She wants everyone at the table to be smarter than her. That's why I was, that's, a, well, that's a great that CEO. That would have been a great president. You know, if you think about what a president does, what a great CEO does, Imagine. he'll maybe make one to two or three strategic moves over four years and six hires. 
And if you get those six hires right or 10 hires, whatever it is, but a, a cadre of people and you set the right two or three major initiatives, that's the job. Everything else is dressing. Everything else is ceremonial for both the CEO and a president. It's, it's, it's interesting. Completely, completely agree. And look, it's one of the reasons why, I mean, I've stayed with her 25 years and there are plenty of people who've stayed a long time. And that's a testament to her leadership. It's a testament to the work she does. She keep, that has that, you know, that ability. Somebody said the other day, one of our partner groups said the thing that the secret that thing people don't know about Hillary Clinton is that she is a young leader incubator. She sees in other people that what they are good at, what they are talented at. And uh, not everyone has the ability to do no. that. I mean, she knew I could do this. Yeah. This. Yeah. You know, I'm doing the thing that scares me the most right now. Right. I'm talking to you. Right. But she knew I could do it. Yeah. And um, and it's helpful to have people like that in your life. There's all of a sudden rumblings about Hillary in 24. I mean, is there anything to that? Oh, my God. I mean, welcome to politics. She has <laughs> said she's going to be part of politics for the rest of her life, not as a candidate. You know, yeah. she's been there twice, and she's certainly doing everything she can to help the administration. Boy, do they have their job cut out for them. It has been a hard year, one-year yeah. anniversary, right? And yeah. um, the pandemic, and it, it's just, and the, the division in our country, Yeah, um, it's a really scary time. I mean, you would think that the pandemic, having this national crisis, would have brought us, would together. Have brought us all yeah. together. And it's, no. I, and it's not been the case. And, uh, and so I, these guys really have a lot of a lot to do. Biden's got a lot. And one thing, and I said this on the air last week, and I took a lot of shit for it. Mm. Part of the problem, and I love Joe Biden, and Joe Biden is a good man by anybody's measure who knows yes. him. I don't think he's been a powerful messenger. I, I don't think he's come across as an inspirational leader. Uh, this is just, there's a, there's a thing that, ha there's a thing that emotes from you and he's comes across as old and that's not an ageist thing to say. It's just, it is, he doesn't come across with his hands on the wheel. Everybody keeps blaming the Democrats don't have a message. The Democrats don't have a message. And I think, and as much as I love Joe Biden and want him to succeed, I do not think he has been a powerful messenger. And I think the Democrats need to understand that. And instead of, they're, they're so afraid of this at this point of Donald Trump, and they're so afraid that I don't think people are taking inventory on what needs to change and what needs to happen for the Democrats. Well, you know, people, uh, you know this, but the party that is out of power is always more energized. Sure, of course, yeah. I mean, everyone's expecting, you know, everyone's expecting the midterms to be hard for my our party. And it will be, Absolutely. but that's normal. It's that's history. History. It's history. Just, you know, that's history playing out. Joe Biden won the popular vote in this country by 7, 7 million, million votes, votes. Right. not by a small number. You know, his message that worked in that election was this ability to get things done. He could get big things done. He has gotten some big well, things done. Well, he has. This. I mean, the interesting thing is he's got $2 trillion mm -hmm. uh, COVID package. He's got a $2 trillion infrastructure bill. He's got 40... Uh, federal judges appointed more than any. I mean, so the message is there. That's what I'm saying that I just, I'm having issues with the messenger at this point. I, his presser was today. I have, we're doing, well, this will probably air in another week or two. So I haven't seen his presser today. I don't know how he did, but um, I, I want more from him. I do. I, I think I, I, you know, I know these people. Sure. Um, most, many of the, many of the people in leadership, I have the honor of knowing them. I, they are patriots. They're doing the best they can. I know that. But they've there. There's a lot of headwinds, and it's you know our. Um, uh, I I I'm I'm glad I'm not there to be honest. I'm just yeah. being very blunt yeah. because I've been on the inside. I've been on the inside and the outside, and on the outside, it's much easier to you know yell yeah. and scream. You should be doing it this way and that way, and on the outside, it's um it, sorry on the inside, it's just there's just so many balls they're juggling and trying to figure out and. Uh, and so I commend them for the work that they're doing. And I think they're, they're, they're going to figure it out. I just think it's only been a year. It's, it's not a one, one year. It's not, it's a, not one a one year, year race. It's, it's not a one year race. It's, You're it's absolutely a one, right. not a one year race. So he's just give these guys some time, but I think, so you, I think they're going to get it So you've been asked about, this will not be an original question. We're asking anyway, yeah. you would make a great candidate. And you, you, when you've asked about it, you said, I'm not going to say no. Uh, would you ever get, you know, a first step is the book. Of course, that's the first I'm time not, you're out in front. You're out in front. Would you ever think about running for office? I, I see. Here's the thing. I know too much about what it takes <laughs> to be a candidate, which is right. why it, it makes it. I, look, I think there's a whole new generation of young people, that are young candidates, and 
you know, people who were elected in 2018 and 2020, and I'm happy that they're doing it. I don't know that I'd be that good. I got to figure, I do have to figure out what I'm doing. And maybe you'll give me an advice, uh, you know, off camera about what that is. But I just, just, I don't see myself running for office and I'm not sure I'd be very good, but it's my year of saying yes. So I've said yes to everything, but that's, there's a big but with a capital B. So what would be, you mentioned the the new Huma before you use that word new. So what is, what is the new Huma? What, what is, let's do a little work here. Okay. (laughs) What, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? I, I don't, maybe I want to still be Christiane Amanpour. Maybe I want to do, maybe I want to go back into journalism. Sure. Maybe. You, you know, must, I, you must get offers all the time. I mean, Zucker must be, uh, 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 you know, up, up your tail. I mean, everybody, you, you, you would be ama- you're amazing. You have amazing presence. You've do got. I really? See that? We've only learned this in the last two months. If, okay. If that is actually the case because I was shaking. Um, and that's funny. You know, that I answered the question about running for office. It was my, it was the Today Show. It was the first interview I ever did. I was shaking. I was cold. I was so nervous. Right. Um, but, you know, I was so much of my life was so controlled. No, no. I said no to everything. If it wasn't directly related to Hillary and work and getting her elected to the Senate or elected, you know, president or helping her as secretary of state, everything else was no. Mm-hmm. Cause it would be a distraction. And now I'm just, I just, I'm open to so many more um, ideas and possibilities. And I should have those conversations. I haven't been yet, but I want to start having some conversations. Yeah, but I do think being out in the world and maybe exploring journalism is interesting to me. Um, I loved doing podcasts. Maybe I'd be somebody's sidekick one day. I don't know. I don't think you're a sidekick. I think what's so compelling about your brand is you have two things going for you that will connect with an audience. One, you mm. you're brilliance and credentials of and what you bring to the table of your 25 years of experience professionally. And two, there's a built-in empathy for you because mm. of what you went through. And those two things will make people lean in. Uh, you know, you, you, there's, you, you can't not look at you and be both impressed and empathize. And so when you have those two things together, I'm just doing a little, little spitballing here, you would be a great public presence. People will be rooting for you. And I think that that's something to think about. And if I was career tracking you, I would say definitely being on air in some capacity and bringing your expertise and bringing that empathy thing to the table because you're somebody that the audience will be rooting for. And you're also somebody that as you were analyzing, reporting, talking about the trip downward, there's going to be a different, per- and also the trip upward. There's going to be a perspective that you're bringing to the table that I think would be very valuable. So that's just, that's just from the cheap seats. Are you saying that I can list you as a reference? You can list me as a major <laughs> reference. Okay, final question. I'm going to let you go because you, I know how busy you are. Any, anything new in the personal life? Any any special people in any special person in your life? I have nothing to report. Nothing. But I have I have told my colleagues that I will go on a date in 2022. That's on my like that was on my list. 2022. Of- okay. I think I think it's time. Once again, another person. I people come to me for advice. I because those who can't do and those who can't teach, you know. Um, and because I've been married twice, I haven't gotten that right. But I do think it's time. If I was your older brother, I would say it is time for you to go on a date and um, even though you that's have pro- any, if you have know anybody interesting, okay, um, I, you know, you pass them along. It's very, it's hard to date in New York. It's funny. I was doing an interview the other day, and the woman said, "You know, you should just go on on one of those dating." No, websites. <laughs> I, I just, I, the whole idea of it you is cannot. terrifying. To me. I, maybe I'm still a, a romantic. Like I just want to meet somebody yeah. somewhere, and, like have a connection. I got you, and I've had that. I mean, part of it is like I did have that experience of having what I thought was a really special connection. Sure. Somebody. And, and so, you did it. To, how are you guys doing co-parenting? How is that? We, we manage pretty well, actually. Yeah. And, you have to, you uh, have to work back from the kid. I, I, I always say, I, I get so angry at people that can't get it right. Oh, have to. And then the kid suffers. You work back from, and if you're working back from the kid, you know when to bite your lip, you know when to do. And, and so that's really good to you. I'm glad to hear that. Really. Am. No, absolutely. And you don't want cycles repeating themselves and your child should feel loved and safe and secure and, you know, be able to tell you anything they want. And, yeah. and, and, you know, he's, we have to model good behavior for him. So how's Anthony doing? He's doing okay. I mean, he, he always seems to be doing okay. Right. But, uh, 
um, yeah, I wish him well. And I know he's wishing me well and, Good. and, uh, we have to move on. Otherwise there's no other way, you know, that's it. Well, Huma, I, this is a real pleasure. You're, you were a delight. The book is both and a life in many worlds. So the, the big scoop today is that sometime in this year, whom is going to go on a date. So for yeah. all you eligible bachelors out there, <laughs> we'll, we'll take your calls. Continued success. I, I so appreciate you, Candor, and your time today, Huma. Thanks. Thanks, Donnie. I've loved talking to you. I really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. We'll speak to you soon. I hope to see you in Paula one of these days, okay? Yes, me too. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm gonna Thank you, Good to see you. Thanks for listening today. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere that you get podcasts, Spotify, Apple. Please rate, review, and subscribe. And you can catch our videos on YouTube and there. Subscribe also, please, and give us your comments. We love hearing from you. We'll see you next week on On Brand. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.